Jeff Liebert, and I'm a PhD student at Cornell University, where I focus my research on agricultural ecology. My grandfather was an orchardist in British Columbia, and I used to love going there in the summer to pick cherries straight from the trees. Driving through the Okanagan Valley, I remember how sweet the air smelled. You knew what was in season because you could almost taste the fruit when you rolled down the windows. We all have our own personal relationship with food as well as shared experiences. And if we're gonna have a conversation about the future of Canada, we have to talk about food and agriculture. Food is something we interact with on a daily basis. It connects people to each other and to nature. Food can be a common language between two people that don't otherwise share one. And it's at the heart of most cultures. But how do we value food in Canada? How do we value our farmers? Disembedded from place, food has become largely anonymous, something we pluck from shelves in seasonless supermarkets. I want to address some persistent myths about the food system that have profound influence on the ways food is discussed and understood, on the food and agricultural policies that are enacted and upheld, and on the growing corporate control over what it is you're eating and who gets to eat it all. Most people are aware that the human population is expected to increase to around 9 billion by the year 2050. In order to feed an additional 2 billion people, you might have also heard that we need to dramatically increase food production with the most common estimate um, at around an increase of 70%. However, there are some highly problematic assumptions that underpin this estimate. To put it plainly, these assumptions mean that the calls to double our food production are pushing us towards one way of growing, distributing, and eating food. Based on recent history, it is, to be sure, a disastrous way to continue. We currently produce more than enough food to feed everyone on this planet, yet of the roughly seven billion of us alive today, nearly one billion suffer from chronic hunger, two billion are afflicted by some form of micronutrient deficiency, and over two billion are overweight or obese. Paradoxically, as Raj Patel famously put it, we are both stuffed and starved. There are a lot of interconnected reasons for this, such as poverty, lack of access to healthy food, unequal and exploitative agricultural policies, food waste, and a diet high in animal products. As the human population increases, some people are also becoming much more affluent, although not the majority, and accompanying this increase in wealth is an increase in meat consumption and processed foods. Right about now is when most people politely nod, feign interest, but in their mind they know what's coming. I'm gonna say something about the need to reduce meat consumption, or worse, I'll say that we all need to eat kale three times a day to save the world. The former is irrefutable based on a huge amount of research across a wide array of disciplines. If the price of meat in the grocery store actually reflected the true cost of production, that is both environmental and human health costs, meat would return to what was once for our agrarian ancestors an infrequent centerpiece to special occasion meals only. It is also widely claimed that genetically engineered crops are feeding the world and that without them we will never be able to achieve global food security. However, the most widely planted genetically engineered crops primarily end up as animal feed, uh, refined and processed um, into highly manufactured foods, turned into biofuels, or used as fiber. Simply put, these genetically engineered crops take an awfully long and costly way to end up on our plates, and many of them never do. In fact, it's actually small and medium-sized family farms around the world that produce 60 to 70% of the world's food, not large-scale industrial farms. Most agricultural scientists and governments are advocating a very narrow approach to addressing global food insecurity, and that is increasing crop yields. The problem with this approach is that there's no attempt to address the systemic shortcomings of the current industrial agricultural paradigm, yet it is this very same corporate food regime that ignores all ecological costs and has entrenched inequalities throughout our agricultural system, ensuring that some of us are stuffed while others starve. In other words, we pay the price while well, large agribusinesses reap the benefits. Why then do we expect that a slightly greener version of this industrial model will address food insecurity in the future when it has failed to do so now and in the past? But it doesn't have to be this way. We do have a choice in Canada. If we truly desire a better country, then we must boldly reimagine what agriculture and a sustainable food system should look like. 
When I envision an alternative food system in Canada, it is one that is socially just, ecologically regenerative, and equitable. These values draw us to food sovereignty, which is defined as the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods. More importantly, food sovereignty is also about the right to define and thus control our food and agricultural systems. Through this declaration, food sovereignty positions itself in direct opposition to the corporatized industrial food system. It also goes beyond food security in that it defines healthy food as a human right and it describes how food should be produced. In Canada, food sovereignty will reflect the diversity of our people and landscapes. For example, indigenous food sovereignty on the coast of BC often emphasizes hunting, fishing, gathering, and trading or sharing traditional foods. On Prince Edward Island, a grassroots food sovereignty movement would develop quite differently, representing the distinct soils, climate, farming, and fishing traditions that exist here. To be clear, food sovereignty is not just some abstract academic concept. La Via Campesina, which represents over 200 million farmers worldwide, is an international movement that defined the term food sovereignty in the 1990s. And the National Farmers Union in Canada was one of the founding members. Food sovereignty is a framework for transformative social change, and at its core, it is a participatory democracy. It demands that decisions about the food system be in the hands of farmers and eaters, not agribusinesses. Throughout Canada, we can already see inspiring and successful contributions to a new vision of food sovereignty. Organizations are helping new farmers acquire land, community-supported agricultural programs are becoming more common, and school gardens are teaching kids how to grow food while replacing some of the unhealthy food in cafeterias with fresh and nutritious fruits and vegetables. <laughs> to scale up these efforts, we will eventually need to work with those in government, which is why it's really important that we create a really strong and united voice. Although food sovereignty might look different across Canada, we will find solidarity through shared values. Farming will be based on the principles of agroecology, consumers will become co-producers of the food system, gender and racial equity, social justice and autonomy will be defended, stronger connections between urban residents and rural communities will be forged, and indigenous people's rights will be acknowledged and upheld. There is enormous potential to realize food sovereignty in Canada, but there are some critical questions that we have to ask ourselves. Do we desire a food system that ignores the immense, irreversible degradation of the environment? Do we desire a food system that is based on monocultures, thus making it highly vulnerable to the effects of climate change? Do we really want a food system that perpetuates social and economic inequality? Or do we desire a food system that promotes social justice, ecological sustainability, and the production of healthy food that is affordable and accessible to all? If we truly desire a better country, we must work, to better, work together to create one. Thank you. Thank you.